inside the walls of America's toughest prisons. This ain't the place to be, man. Bad, real bad. Unwanted dogs are touching the hearts of hardened criminals. For me, it softened, it softened me up on the inside. For the dogs, it's a second chance at life. We're like their, their one chance to make it, you know? For the inmates, it's a chance for redemption. I can't take back what I did, but I can give back. This is a new breed of death row inmate. Society's case against them is a laundry list of offenses, disobedience, digging, running away, and worst of all, biting. No one wants dogs with problems like these. If they don't shape up, they will be put to sleep. Locked up for crimes ranging from assault to murder, these men have already hit the end of the line. Nevada State Prison, or we call it NSP. Used to put gray hair on a guy just even knowing he was coming here. The first thing they did when they got here was get armed and ready, ready to get down. It was a bad atmosphere. All right. 75% of the population went to the infirmary for murders, stabbings, weights getting dropped on your head. Nevada State Prison is one of the oldest in the country, known for especially violent inmates. Last year, things were getting so bad, Warden Michael Budge knew he had to do something different. He decided his inmates needed more than just distraction. They needed a goal, something they could care about. We had to come up with something for these guys to do that didn't cost the taxpayers any money. And uh, we got with the Humane Society, and they basically funded the money for our puppy program. Channel, everybody. All over the country, programs to rescue and socialize unadoptable dogs are having a positive impact on prisons. But at first, Lord Budge had his doubts. The day that they brought the first eight dogs here, I was here when they came. And I watched them come in. I watched them walk the yard. I watched the inmate interact with it. I watched staff. I went home that night and said, oh, my God, what have I done? Sit. Oh. Inmates volunteer to be trained by the Humane Society. But they're not approved until they pass a strict screening test and psychological profile. Among the inmates chosen for the program were lifers Michael Doyle and Steve Velasco. We took classes. We went through an extensive screening process. The requirements you think can have uh, sexual assault, domestic violence, or uh, cruelty to any animals in, in any prior behavior that they have record of. It was exciting to be chosen for the program, but it was also scary. We were taken to a place where we're going to be responsible for the care and the upkeep of another living thing. And, and you're going to take socks? I'll take socks. Okay. <laughs> After extensive training, the eight inmates chosen for the program moved their problem dogs into their new home. Ironically, it's cell block number five. Old death row. Here in these 10 by 7 foot cells, the dogs are under the constant care and supervision of their inmate hampers. They'll stay here until they're fit to be adopted. It may take a month or up to a year. For some of the inmates, their stay will be a lot longer. I'm in for the crime of murder, and I've been here 24 years. Uh, I'm in here for first-degree murder. I was sentenced to 10 to life on the murder and 10 to life on the use of a deadly weapon. Although Steve and Michael will probably never get paroled, they're determined to win the dogs their freedom. But first, they've got to change some bad habits. Like Tilly, who couldn't be trusted around cats, and Roxy, who was too rough with children. That's a good girl. 
since these are dogs that people didn't want. And they had high hopes that we could save their lives. Yeah. Which one? <laughs> As Steve and Michael got busy teaching manners to Roxy and Tilly, something amazing started to happen. The dogs were changing the whole feel of the prison. It brought a sense of innocence to this place. It, it used to, inmates felt that the, you know, it had to be tough and they have to put this armor on, you know, just to survive in a, an environment like this. But all of a sudden you bring a, a, a puppy, a dog into this equation and, and they can break down those barriers, those racial barriers, those tension between staff. All those barriers can be broken down. I don't know if it's coincidence or not, but I have not had to break up a fight since the puppy program began. Smart dog. We've got people coming out of their units that never came out except for their canteen or their work. They're coming down to the lower yard to sit and pet and play with the dogs. Hey, girl, how you doing? How you doing, Roxy? One of the things that you don't do, you get to see in prison a lot is honey and baby and, and how's my girl doing? And, and so all those all those soft feelings come out and, and you like them. You know, everybody likes them. When we come back, can Michael help Tilly and saying goodbye to a new friend on Cell Dogs? I'll miss her. She's a good dog. Only on Animal Planet. After just six weeks, Nevada State Prison's puppy program is having an astonishing effect on the inmates. Violence is down more than 40%. Yeah. But the main purpose of the program is to give once unadoptable dogs a second chance, something inmate Steve Olofsson can relate to. Steve was minutes away from execution when his death sentence was commuted to life without parole. The three judges that, that took me off uh, the death sentence, you know, they had faith in me then. I'm glad to be on a program like this uh, to let them know that uh, I didn't let them down, that their faith was well, well placed. I'm gonna call. Oh, <laughs> Steve's only one of eight inmates selected for the puppy program. He's devoted to helping Roxy succeed, and he has an unlikely supporter, Officer Hanky. I've known him. Shoot, how long has it been? You knew me when I was twenty-two uh, years. Yeah. And so, so he's known me ever since I was a youngster, and I've always worked and gone to school and and uh, and uh, so when I applied for the program. Uh, fortunately enough for me that there are officers still around after 22 years and 24 years to say, you know, it'd be good for the program. Hey, Roxy. Hey, girl. Before the dogs arrived, Steve and Officer Hankey were never allowed to develop a friendship. All conversations were strictly business. But Roxy has changed all that. She's given them something to work for, together. We have a common uh, goal now. And that is to make these dogs turn out perfect, turn out good, so they're accepted by society. Is it you making all that noise, huh? Is it you making all that noise? Also, uh, the relationship we have now with the inmates, I can walk the yard and not feel any kind of a hostility. It is uh, a common respect, trust. Somehow we found a bond, a common bond. All right, good girl, good girl, huh? Steve knows that eventually Roxy will be adopted and taken away from him. He never would have expected it, but it's going to be a tough goodbye. When you don't feel pain, when you get numb to, uh, to prison, and you get numb to the bad things that happen in prison, and then one day, all of a sudden, you got this ache in your heart, and, uh, and, and you never thought that you could feel loss again. And, uh, uh, yeah, she told me I had a heart, and it's big because I feel it. And I'm not going to give a hugger or cradle. I was just really lucky to have this girl with me.
Inmates may not have years of dog training experience, but they have something even more valuable, time. They have that 24-7 that they can give that dog. And so that's why these dogs have learned more than they have than if we did it out in the street or if it was a private trainer. Most of the dogs have been neglected, if not abused, that will come to us. And they won't get neglected here. There's 700 people that are dying to give them a hug and a pat, a pat, recognize them. When Michael Doyle's dog, Tilly, first arrived, Michael could tell she was very depressed. Tilly came in in a condition where you couldn't tell she had a tail unless you lifted her hind leg and looked up underneath. Her ears were never up, never. She wouldn't look at people. She was shy. I couldn't hardly walk her the first few days, so I decided to back off, let her get used to the environment a little first. With lots of care and attention, Michael finally convinced Tilly to venture out. He even started taking her to his job in the mattress shop. She's, uh, she's come a long way. We've gone from walking one lap with problems on a leash to the point where we walk five or six laps every morning and every afternoon without a leash. And she stays right with me. Tilly, come here. She's taught me how to use my voice. The more bold you are with your voice, does not get you anywhere. Old saying you can catch more bees with honey. <laughs> it's so true. If I keep my voice in an even keel, she'll do anything in the world for me. She's eager to please. Besides caring for their dogs, inmates are also responsible for keeping detailed records of their progress. They even developed a web page to look for people who might adopt them. I think it's a win-win situation for this institution, the inmates, and the public and the people that adopt these dogs. I really seriously think it is. The downside of it all, I think, and I have animals myself, is I'm sure it's going to be very difficult for these inmates to give that dog up because this is all new to them, too. All of a sudden, they have a responsibility. They have something they've cultivated and trained into something that, that is desirable for adoption, and then they have to say goodbye. For Michael, the time to say goodbye is today. Tilly's been adopted by a family that lives on a 10-acre farm. Oh, I'm going to miss her, but I'm going to be happy that she's going to a good home. Take your last walk, Tilly. Bye, Tilly. You got your parole. You're out of here. Take it easy. She's taught me patience, very much so, uh, more than I had in the first place. Um, she's taught me that anybody can change and anything can change, given the time and the patience and the respect that, that's needed for the situation. Great job. Good. Mm. One, one last treat, oh, Tilly. One last. I'll miss her. She's a good dog. She learned everything I wanted to teach her and more. A good feeling in my heart that she's going to a, a good home. What can I say? <laughs> hey. All over again. But Michael didn't have much time to spend missing Tony. Later that same day, he met his new dog. Max. <laughs> Can a puppy soften up one of the toughest cons? I was just an all-around bad guy, you know, just not a good person. Coming up on Cell Dogs. Correctional Institution, St. Clairsville, Ohio. Population, inmates, 2,200. 
dogs, 20. The prison's dog program started in 1998, and today it's one of the largest in the country. Make sip. Serving life for aggravated murder, Wally Pasco has become one of the most skillful dog handlers. At first, I didn't want to get involved with it. Nick, you? Wally was an alcoholic and drug addict who ran with a motorcycle gang. The idea of working with any kind of animal wasn't his thing. And then he brought in the two cutest little puppies labs you ever saw in your life. That encounter would change his life. So I got to go through the training program of actually training a dog, and I got to groom the dog, and, and I, this unconditional kind of love back and forth was like, it was more than I'd had in years and years and years. I have a, uh, I'll see if it, And since 1998, Wally's newfound love and dedication has changed the lives of 12 dogs. That was Molly. My God, I never had any responsibilities. And now it's all you have with a dog. It's, it's all responsibilities. The dog program is not brought in as a benefit to the inmates. It is brought in because it is a program which forces the inmates to be responsible. For a dog handler, you are responsible for everything. You're responsible for brushing this dog's teeth every day, for brushing its coat, for bathing it, for walking it. To help the inmates with their responsibilities, the prison authorizes the use of certain amenities. Lots of treats, this is a brush, different flavored toothpaste, yeah. this is beef, shampoo we use, ear cleaner. It is a 24 hour day, 365 day a year responsibility. They never are allowed to relax. These are paper darts you got. Yes, they are. High five. Wally's newest dog, Mickey, came from Golden Endings, a golden retriever rescue program. Goldens like Mickey are placed at Belmont where they're nurtured and rehabilitated before being adopted. Whoever had him neglected him. When he came in, he was kind of raw around the neck from the chain. He had mats all over his body that were so bad they were, they were pulling the hair away from the skin. They were huge. And uh, he was completely overweight from where they just left him chained up outside, no exercise. Mickey will live with Wally in Belmont's minimum security unit for inmates with records of good behavior. Mickey and Wally share a six by seven foot cubicle. For Wally, after living in a maximum security cell for 13 years, his new home was frightening. Pretty much scared of me coming here because it was so open. You could sleep in a box. There was no bars to protect you from. The, I'm used to being around people that will stab you and hurt you. Once Wally got used to the new environment, his next challenge was to fill up the extra time he got in minimum security. The dogs took care of that. My day starts at about 3 o'clock in the morning. I get up and I uh, wash the dog bowl, brush the dog off a little bit, feed the dog, then we, the CO let us take the dog outside. I come out here and I head right down to that garden. The dog goes everywhere with I mean, till the time I go to sleep and he goes to sleep, the dog's with me. So he's with me almost 24 hours a day. At first, letting go of new friends was hard for Wally. The first dog I had that I had to get rid of that I had for a year it was a hard thing. So right then, you know, I was trying to make a decision, well, this, this really hurts. Do I want to quit this or do I want to continue on? But then he realized he needs the dogs as much as they need him. This is a very honest relationship. He, he doesn't lie to me, you know, and uh, he doesn't cheat on me. And I have to stay sober now to keep a dog. For me to stay sober for any reason is, like, unbelievable. This dog and the other dogs have helped me so much that it's just, like, I can't even say how much they've helped me. They, like, save me, you know. That's how I look at it. Kurt Rakovich is a career criminal, serving a 25-year sentence. All his life, he's used his tattoos to create a scary, tough guy image. I guess he does have uh, some foot offishness. It, it keeps people that I don't really want around me away from me. Kurt's tattoos put up a barrier between him and the staff and put fear into other inmates. I got a... I got a cold shoulder from most of the staff when I first got here, and for the most part while I was here. 
All that changed when Kurt met a dog named Delta. I've always loved animals, dogs especially. They said they were going to bring a dog program to the housing unit that I was in, so I signed up for it. I was lucky enough to get such a great dog. How long do you train her for so that type of program? I, I'll have her for till up to a year or 18 months old. After a while, Kurt's appearance didn't seem to bother anyone, even a group of visitors interested in the dog program. Have you trained dogs previously? This is your first. This is my first. What do you think? I think it's a handful. <laughs> with, with Delta, it's given me a chance to develop a rapport with some of the staff who would never have spoke to me because they were put off from my physical attributes. And I've noticed a larger percentage of people speak to me now because of the dog. After opening emotional doors for Kurt, Delta will one day open real doors for others. She's being trained to assist the hard of hearing and physically challenged. Pause with a Cause is one of Belmont's newest and most challenging dog programs. As one of the program's finest trainers, Kurt's taken a lot of good from the experience. I was full of anger and I was just an all around bad guy, you know, just not a good person. And what she's given back to me is uh, patience back. She's given me a responsibility to take care of. I mean, I have something to do besides just take care of me. All the dogs are donated by private breeders. They come in for a year to 18 months. They're here to learn basic obedience, get over the puppy stage, learn socialization skills, how to be around crowds, and be around just different types of people. Although they've only been together for six weeks, Delta and Kurt are making great progress. Delta has to learn a special set of commands. She's not choked or corrected. All correction is, is voice control. No physical corrections at all. It's all voice control and patience. Lots of patience. She's the best companion I've had in 15 years. And for the most part, she listens great. And then there's times where she's still just a puppy. But Kurt knows that Delta will have to grow up and leave him. I know watching a companion such as her, Delta, to leave is going to be, it'll probably be a, a teary day. I mean, I know I'm not immune to it. She's allowed me to, to feel it again. I mean, she's allowed me to understand a love for something other than myself. I'll probably one day get a tattoo for it in memory of Delta because uh, she's a very special lady in my life right now. And, uh, it's, that's what tattoos are there for, to show parts, parts of a person's life. Never before have so many women put in hard time just for dogs. They've got something to prove. So my expectations of them are very, very high. Up next on Cell Dogs. The Edna Man Correctional Facility is New Jersey's only women's prison. Over 1,000 inmates are incarcerated here. And it's also the home of puppies behind bars. A very strict dog program. Strict because these dogs will not be going up for adoption. They'll be going to work. Puppies Behind Bars trains puppies to be comfortable with all kinds of people in every situation. All the inmates have to sign three-page contracts when they come in the program. Turn it down, please. Gloria Stoga, the Puppies Behind Bars director, keeps standards very high. And it's tough for inmates to get into the program. Where do you put her hand? Yeah. Well, I do put it on, on her shoulder. Where do you put it? Right there, that's going to help her swing out. Right there, it's going to keep her straight. Oh, she's so pretty today. I tell the inmates that just because they're inmates, I am not going to relax my standards. As a matter of fact, I'm going to hold them to higher standards because they've got something to prove. What's your dogs in a sit?
put your dogs in a down and put your dogs in a stay without saying a word. So my expectations of them are very, very high. And I would rather kick people out of the program than relax the standards. And I think because the standards are so high, that's why we've been so successful. The canine alumni of Puppies Behind Bars are an elite group. 24 seeing eye dogs, eight companions for blind children, and eight bomb detection dogs for the Department of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and the New York Police Department. When he came into the institution, he was six and a half weeks old. He was a little teeny weeny furball that didn't know his name. He knew nothing. He was just a pure um, blank canvas that I had to teach everything to. But he sit. Peggy Cosman's mission is to socialize nine-month-old rugby and to get him ready to become a seeing eye dog. Rugby will be here for um, until he turns a year old, and uh, he should go shortly thereafter back to the guide dog school, uh, which he'll enter class. And they spend anywhere from four to six months at the school, and then they leave, and they make someone's life pretty awesome. When not training dogs, Peggy works in the library. She served nine years on her sentence for aggravated murder and has spent most of that time trying to make up for her crime. It was uh, a very abusive relationship, and I felt at the time there was no way out but death. And it was a huge mistake that I'm forever going to be shameful of and forever going to pay in my heart as well as in society when I do get you know, back and reintegrate into society, something that I have to live with and something that I hope to help other women to avoid. While Peggy tries to improve herself, rugby helps to fill a big empty space in her life. Yeah, I've been away from my daughter and my grandson for almost a decade. So that's one of the reasons why it was so important for me to get into this program and have this because I can put that love that you can't in prison you know, I can put that love that I can't give to my children to this puppy. And that is the reward I get, the love. The puppies live with their primary trainer. Take a dog you haven't had. But their basic training is a group effort, with inmate handlers working as a team. What's up, mommy? Girl. Tony, mom. Good boy. Girl. Hey, wait, wait. Leave it. Good. Leave it. Good. Very nice. No matter what they're training or where they are, for the inmates, the technique is the same. Puppy! Oh, what a good girl! What a, a lot of patience and praise. Yes, that's a good girl. Yes, that's a good girl. This is a tough place. Um, you're away from your children. You're away from your family. 46-year-old Karen Allen is in for murder. I committed murder. Um, I was married to my husband. He came home one day and decided that he wanted to leave me for a 15-year-old girl. I was so stressed out. And eventually, six months down the line, I was addicted to crack cocaine. One night, I went out. And when I woke up from going out that night, I woke up in the hospital with officers around me. And I was in and out of it. And they told me that I killed my mother. When Karen was first incarcerated, she isolated herself from the other inmates. Until she met her puppy, Michael. Well, I like to hide in my room a lot. And he's taught me to get out more, watching him play with the other dogs, and to just interact more. And that's what he's taught me. So it's good to get out now. And I go out and scare myself, but I do. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Karen now has a full day of activity to keep her and Michael busy. Michael's with me 24 hours a day. We go to work. We go outside and play. We go on visits. Um, everything I do, Michael does with me. Karen seen Michael make great strides in the past four months. But more important than training is the emotional joy he gives her. Michael lets Karen be the mother she never got to be. Now my oldest daughter's 30 years old, so it's been a gap, a lot of years, a gap, you know, and you begin to think, can I really care for somebody hands-on? And it's just like a baby. You have to wash them, get masks, brush them, brush their teeth, clean their ears, feed them, make sure they're okay, take them out there, run them, 
So it's a lot of work. It's just like taking care of your child 24 hours a day. For all the love the puppies receive, they give back just as much to the women. Each of these dogs has heard every single life story in here. I haven't. Guards haven't. Maybe even their family members haven't. But these dogs have. They have had the women cry. They've had the women embrace them with joy. They've gone through all of the emotions that these women go through. And in many cases, the dogs are indeed the catalyst towards allowing the women to express their emotion. So that kind of unconditional love, you know, as they tell you, you know, I told them the horrible thing I did, and they still licked my face. What more could you ask for, especially in this kind of setting? One, two, three, you're free! Can a dog program help young offenders confront their crimes? I'll describe McLaren as a place that gives you a second chance. Find out on Cell Dogs. I'm in here for a uh, robbery in the first degree. I'm gonna be here for seven and a half years. I've already done 40 years. Nicholas is serving time at Oregon's McLaren Youth Correctional Facility, one of the largest and oldest reformatories in the United States. Founded 111 years ago, it is home to 400 youth offenders. Everyone here will be released to the community at some point in time, and it's our jobs to provide them the opportunity to gain the skills uh, to get their lives under control and not be a burden on society. Which means that one day, Nicholas will be free again. The bottom line for us uh, is to provide the community with some level of public safety even after these youth leave this facility. At McLaren, Project Pooch is one form of rehabilitation that's been successful, matching high-risk young men with high-risk dogs. That is, dogs at risk of being put to sleep. The idea is together, they can save each other's lives by changing bad behavior. There's something about that relationship and caring for an animal and having that responsibility that seems to assist these young men in, in kind of getting a grasp on their own lives. As Nicholas's treatment manager, Tim Vandersteen thought Project Pooch could help Nicholas with some of his problems. He had a pretty tough guy image, and Nick has had a hard time to uh, get beyond that because that was his lifestyle. That's what he lived. He had to be tough. <laughs> to become a better dog trainer, Nicholas had to do something he was not accustomed to. He had to show outward praise and affection. When I uh, first started, it was just like, oh, good dog. Uh, and then just turn around and walk away. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, you get more into it. Come on. Good girl. Good girl. And so working with uh, Pooches and the program, um, actually have seen Nick soften quite a bit. One of the key things they do is they praise the dog. They're excited. They praise them out loud. And a lot of the guys and Nick had some problems with that because that tough guy image, it's hard to say, oh, good pooch, great dog, blah, 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 in front of all the guys around uh, because they're tough guys. Nicholas needed that softer side when he met an energetic dog named Chloe. You learn how to have your patience and work with them. You know, you learn that you, you learn something about yourself. You learn, if you set your mind to it, you can train the dog and they'll listen to you as well. So she missed me, huh? She did. She heard you whistle this morning when I was walking her from the cottage, and she knew it when you were whistling. All Nicholas's hard work paid off. Chloe was adopted by his treatment manager, Tim. I think when Nick saw Chloe, he thought maybe it'd be a good dog for us and brought her over to the cottage. She was a really good-natured, easygoing dog, real friendly, and uh, picked up to Nick's training right off the bat. Very smart, intelligent dog right here. She's a quick learner. Tim occasionally brings Chloe back for more training with Nicholas, but she doesn't get to stay with him for long. I miss this dog. I miss it a lot. My van picked up on her real quick, and I'm like, you know, that's good because of Lee. I know that she got a good home. 
Unlike the adult prison programs, Project Pooch houses its dogs in kennels. They start licking your hands saying, you don't go. While Nicholas, a gang member for most of his life, lives in Smith Cottage with 25 other youth offenders. This is the Smith Cottage unit. Uh, this is where I live. This is our dorm area. This is where me and a lot of other peers sleep. This is our bathroom. It's kind of messy, but, you know, we try. We have a mixture of all guys. Um, we have uh, guys from all kinds of different gangs, um, Crips, Bloods, the different groups. We actually house them together so that we can teach them to live together and accept each other. That's part of our treatment that we do. Ronnie is another tough guy who could benefit from Project Pooch. But first, he had to get over a very bad experience. I was scared because the dog bit me when I was little. Jumped over a fence and bit me. So I was pretty scared about that. And then come here and I see dogs all white, man, I thought I was going to get bit. So I talked to the, uh, the director of Pooch, Ms. Dalton, and she knew my problem because guys around campus would, would tell her that I'm afraid of dogs. Under the supervision of Project founder and director Joan Dalton, Ronnie began to work out his fear of dogs, one pet at a time. I was scared, but they told me that she's all right and they wouldn't bite me, so I started petting her. Then I started feeding it, and finally I just got used to it. Then he met Calvin, a dog Ronnie had a lot in common with. He's fairly you know, He's 18 months years old, so he's still a puppy, so I still got, he still got a lot of learning to do. But he came from a family. They sent it back to the Humane Society because they said that Calvin nipped at their kids and they were afraid. Down. It proved Down. to be a perfect match. Ronnie and Calvin worked together every day, trying to give each other a second chance. Calvin's learning how to get along with people, and Ronnie is overcoming his childhood fears. And a very, very good experience. I'm not overcome my fears with dogs, and it's just the program is just great. And I just see the, the, the work he does, it just pays off for it. It just, man, I just can't believe that I taught the dog how to do that. Next on Cell Dogs, what's the future for dogs in prison? I'm grateful that all those people did take a chance on us because this is a phenomenal thing. Only on Animal Planet. Marshall Cowens has been at Belmont Correctional Facility in Ohio for 25 years. When the first dog came in, it was like, what's that? Because he hadn't seen a real dog. He figures it's been at least 16 years since he's actually seen a dog. I like, went up and it was a little yellow lab. And she was eight weeks old. And I kind of like sat down and she jumped up and licked me in the face. And it was like, it took a minute, but after that, I just, I, I wanted to get the program. Marshall has been in the program for five years and has loved every minute of it, except for the times when he finds himself in between dogs. It's been three weeks and I'm having withdrawals, and everybody has to put up with me because I'm snappy, and I'm like, you know, well, I don't have a dog, I don't care, <laughs> you know, that type of stuff. But um, you miss it because, I mean, the dog goes everywhere with you. You're used to getting up, looking, seeing the dog, dogs looking at you, you know. Everywhere you go, the dog is part of it, you know. So when you don't have that, it's like, well, the best friend just left. The prison dog programs in America have produced a new breed of inmates, professional dog handlers and trainers. Marshall is proud to be one of them. The biggest thing with the dog, you have to bond with the dog. The dog has to learn to trust you. And then the more, the deeper the bond, the easier the dog is to train. It's a mild matter one. Today, Marshall gets to meet his ninth dog, a short Australian cattle dog mix named Brenda. What's her name? Brenda. 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 The dogs have taught me to, it kind of sounds silly, but to love again. Rusty. Frank Zoppo is another lifer and also one of the premier prison dog handlers. So far, he's saved the lives of 12 dogs. They had some behavioral problems. And we correct those and make them adoptable. They were taken out of shelters where they were going to be put down. And, you know, 
This guy doesn't deserve it. I don't know any of these guys. They're good dogs. We haven't had any bad, bad dogs. We had some dogs with little behavioral problems, like us. Word started getting out. People started requesting dogs from the prison because they were just so obedient. And that kind of, that made us feel good. You know, that our dogs were somehow special. So that made us feel good. Even though we know you're special. A shiny example of the dog program's positive influence is Oregon's McLaren Youth Correction. The young men have started a successful newspaper column and website to share their experiences with the dogs. To date, some 300 offenders who have participated in Project Pooch have been released from McLaren. To our knowledge, at this, at this point in time, there has not been a youth that graduated from the Pooch program that has been convicted of a crime in the community. Since 1981, prison dog programs have been adopted by 65 prisons in 26 states, and more join every year. We've got the stereotype of guys like me, or, or what people think of the guys like me. And they decided to take a chance on us. And I'm, I'm grateful that all those people did take a chance on us, because this is a phenomenal thing. It seems like only good things happen when you put dogs in prison. Across the board, dogs have relieved tension and reduced prison violence. The programs have saved the lives of dogs and maybe inmates too, giving them a chance to give back. My deeply held belief is that we in society are better off if you've got people coming out of prison with skills, with a higher sense of self-esteem, with the ability to feel and display emotion, and with the feeling that they've contributed to society than we are if people are getting out just having pumped iron or watched TV for 15 years. Mm -hmm.